Well, good morning, Watermark Fort Worth, and welcome friends who are tuning in online. My name is Steve Abney, and I have the privilege of serving as an elder here to serve you. And I'm excited to jump in to 1 John uh, 1, verses 5, and then two, through 2, 2 this morning. And so, welcome. I don't know about you, uh, you probably uh, picked up a habit uh, during the lockdown that might have continued uh, into this season, um, but I know I did. And the habit that I picked up uh, during the lockdown was Twitter. Uh, I had uh, given back in. I wanted to know what was going on in the world. And I resurrected my dormant Twitter account. And I just followed along as I saw what was going on in the world. There was a lot going on in the world at that time. And I just wanted to keep up. And so, uh, and it was really edifying for a while. Um, I would get to kind of watch the conversations that were happening in our world uh, and, and I just kind of watch and listen and like, and I didn't really say much. And then eventually I decided I had something to say. And this is what I said. I said, heaven and hell is not separated between good people and bad people. It's separated between forgiven people and unforgiven people. And I expected that to trend. <laughs> and the problem was... I have 10 Twitter followers, <laughs> and they all know Jesus. And so I was just kind of dejected. I was like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm not reaching the right audience. And then I noticed a button at the bottom, and it said, do you want to promote this tweet? And so I clicked on it, and Twitter made me an offer. And they said, for $500, we will promote this tweet, and it will get 2 million impressions and 50,000 engagements. And I was like, I'll take that deal. <laughs> so I put my credit card information into Twitter and paid the 500 bucks. And nothing happened for a few hours. And then later that night, uh, Twitter starts to promote this tweet, which means they put this tweet in front of just random people all across the country. Uh, and so it, my Twitter feed just started to explode. Uh, and people were like, excited about that. People were angry about that. Some people would be like, why is Twitter promoting this religious content in my Twitter feed? And then I'd respond and say, because I paid them to put it there. <laughs> and uh, it just went on and on. And I, got, I even got the opportunity to share the gospel with a few people and explain why we need forgiveness, what we need forgiveness from. But why did I say that? Why did I tweet that? I tweeted that because there is a misconception, even in our culture, in our Christian culture, that what God uh, requires of us is to just be a good person. And that is not the message of the Bible. That is not what God's word says. That all we need to do is just be 51% good, and then we're admitted to heaven, and that that's okay with God. That's a denial of sin, that's a denial of God's nature. And what was happening when John penned 1 John was a denial of sin corrupting our nature and interrupting our fellowship with God. And so John writes this letter to correct that error. We're in this sermon series called This We Know. And the reason we call it This We Know is because John says all these things that we should know to give us assurance. Assurance that we can have genuine fellowship with God, that we can experience joy in the midst of that fellowship. And, and I love what Tyler said last week, that the presence of God is not a feeling, it's a fact. God isn't there just because it feels like he's there. He's there because he's always there, because he's omnipresent. And then for what he says in 1 John is that, hey, I want to give you the assurance that I'm with you so that you may thrive in your relationship with me and have fellowship with me, that you're forgiven, that you're in a relationship, and that you can have fellowship. And that is what 1 John is about. But before we dive in, we need to get a couple things straight. Uh, there are uh, two words we're going to use a ton as we walk through 1 John. And one is our relationship with God, and the other is our fellowship with God. Okay, so our relationship with God is our position as children of God. And our fellowship with God is our practice of walking with him. So let me, let me explain that further. Our relationship is your position as a child of God. This is determined once by your being justified by grace through faith and adopted as a son or daughter of God. It has nothing to do with your works or your goodness. 
Your fellowship with God is your practice of walking with God. And we mean your participation with God in this life. It's the activity and the attitude of following Jesus in truth and in faithfulness. And then out of that is produced this joy and this growth and this vitality to your faith when you walk in fellowship with him. And so to summarize, our relationship is our position as a child of God and fellowship is our practice of walking with God. And if we don't get that right, this is going to be really confusing because I'm going to talk a lot about our fellowship with God today. And so in context, 1 John, John's responding to false teachers that are seeking to remove sin as a problem. But it is a problem. It's a problem that gets in the way of our fellowship with God. And so we're going to talk through three points. That our genuine fellowship starts with God. That genuine fellowship is destroyed by sin. And that genuine fellowship is restored in Christ. So I'm going to read the passage. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to jump in. So read along with me. 1 John 1, verse 5. And we're going to go through chapter 2, verse 2. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. That God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth of God is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and our word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Pray with me. Father, help us this morning as we hear your word to be conformed to it, to trust that what you say is true, to know who you are, that you are light and there is no darkness. And then also for us to learn how to deal with the darkness within us that wrecks our fellowship with you. Would you help us to learn from that and then to get to celebrate how you have restored our relationship in Christ. God, help us this morning as we learn that and as we apply that. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, so point number one, our genuine fellowship starts with God. And so I'm gonna go back to verse five, that this is the message we have all heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And the reason John starts here is because it all starts with God. This is the most important verse in this passage because it has the most important subject. It's talking about God, who he is, what his nature is. And if we don't know who God is, we're not going to know who we are. The doctrine of the Bible is that man can never fully understand himself until he understands who God is as it's revealed in his word. Now there's uh, three books outside of the Bible that have kind of entered into my kind of primary reading rotation that I just read over and over and over. One of them is the gospel primer. Tyler mentioned that, I think, in the First Timothy series by Milton Vincent. It's just a daily reminder of the gospel. The second is Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. It's by Donald Whitney. It's just the gifts that God's given us as disciplines to learn how to grow in our relationship with him. It's an awesome book. And then the third is called Knowledge of the Holy. It's by A.W. Tozer, and it's a really short book, and all it does is tell you who God is. It unpacks the the nature of God uh, through the scriptures. And and it's in that book where the opening line says that when uh, you think of what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Because if we have a wrong understanding of who God is, we're not going to live according to what he would have us do. And so I'm willing to bet that every sin in your life and every wrong doctrine you hold can be traced back to a wrong view of God. Why do you struggle with control? It's probably uh, because you're not trusting that God is sovereign or that he's really that good. Why do you struggle with pornography? Because you don't, you aren't trusting that he is really that satisfying. You know, why uh, do you struggle to spend time in God's word? 
probably because uh, you aren't trusting that he really is omnipresent, that he's not out there somewhere, that he's right here. These can all be traced back to a wrong view of God. And so what does this verse mean? That the, this is the message we have heard announced to you that God is light. What does that mean? Uh, well, God is light uh, means kind of two, it's in two contexts. Intellectually, you know, light is truth and, and darkness is ignorance or error. And then morally, light is purity and holiness and darkness is evil or sin. And so God is light refers to God's perfect knowledge, the reality that he is the source of truth, and it refers to his absolute uh, moral purity. And so in, in his darkness means there's just no darkness in him. He's not corrupted by sin. There's no corruption, no stain. He is light. And so it's like this. Have you ever noticed that light is unable to be corrupted by darkness? Light can be removed, but light can't be corrupted, okay? If you remove light, darkness is present. But when, wherever light is present, darkness is never present. Wherever light is present, there's no darkness there. And darkness is unable to corrupt light because light always pushes out the darkness. It's what light does. It pushes it out. It, they don't exist together. And so what this means is that God's nature cannot be corrupted. And so what does this mean for us? If God were to bring, him, bring us into fellowship with him without dealing with our darkness, uh, one of two things would happen. First, it would corrupt his nature. Now, we know that's not possible. The second is it would destroy us because God is light and in him there is no darkness. And so what this means for us is that God's got to remove our darkness in some way, and we have to understand that he does not fellowship with darkness, but that he is light. And how amazing is it that God found a way to do that? That he found a way to deal with our sin and be holy and be just and to bring us into fellowship with him. And so we've established who God is, that he is light, that there's no darkness in him. And now John turns to address some heretical claims that were being made about sin. And so point two is going to be that genuine fellowship is destroyed by sin. So I'm going to go back and read the passage. And in here, you're going to notice there's three, if we say, statements. Verse six. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So these three if we say statements were coming from a group of people known as the Gnostics. They were denying the resurrected Christ. They were denying that sin was part of their nature and shown in their conduct and, and impacted their fellowship with God at all. They were just saying, we have fellowship with God and yet we can continue to live in immorality and sin and untruthfulness. And John's going, hold on a second. That is not the case. And so when he says, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and practice the truth, what does it mean? What it means is uh, that if we say we're walking with God, but we're really walking in darkness, we're not really walking with God. We're not really following Christ. Back to fellowship, our practice of walking. We, we're not walking with him when we walk in darkness. And so John 8, 12, uh, this is where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. I mean, by definition, Whoever follows me doesn't walk in darkness. So if you're following Christ, you're not walking in darkness. If you're walking in darkness, you're not following Christ. It's really black and white. And so uh, what walking in darkness doesn't mean is just walking in sorrow. I mean, just I can look around this room and I know people that have had to walk through 
the sorrow and pain of grief and loss and hardship. You can have a, a tremendous fellowship walking with God through sorrow. That's not the darkness he's talking about. He's talking about the darkness in the two contexts I mentioned earlier. So let's talk about those. Darkness as ignorance or, 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 or error. Uh, this is holding to a belief that is untrue or in contradiction to God's word. For example, you can't say you're following Jesus and reject his truth about sexuality. You can't say you're following Jesus and reject his truth about marriage. You can't say you're following Jesus and reject his call that every believer be part of a local church. You can say you're walking with Jesus, you're just not walking with Jesus. Uh, and then darkness as evil and sin. That's the second context. This is when you say or do or think something in, a, a, in opposition to God's will or way. So for example, you can say you're following Jesus, uh, you, sorry, you cannot say you're following Jesus and yet continually give yourself over to pornography and lust. You cannot say you're following Jesus and yet continually give yourself to drunkenness and debauchery. You cannot say you're following Jesus and yet uh, not pursue reconciliation with those you're in conflict with or to withhold forgiveness from somebody. You can say you're following Jesus. You're just not following Jesus. And so uh, here's an illustration on this. So the Cowboys are having a tough year, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Uh, three weeks ago, you know, Dak goes down with this gruesome ankle injury. And then our boy Andy Dalton goes in. And, uh, and then last week, man, he takes just this vicious hit to the head and uh, gets a concussion and he's out. So then Ben DiNucci goes in. And you're like, who's Ben DiNucci? <laughs> and, uh, well, Ben DiNucci is the third string quarterback, right? And so uh, that's his relationship to the team. So they, they put Ben in, and, and I think he's going to start today. And now, just imagine if uh, when they put Ben in there, um, Ben uh, just doesn't hold to the playbook. Uh, he's just not so convinced that uh, that playbook is really the way we should go. And so he's kind of come up with his own interpretations of the playbook. Uh, and so when they put him in and they call, hey, Ben, I want you to run pro racer right, X curl, Y delay. And he's like, okay. And then he runs the play and everyone zigs and he zags because he's got a different interpretation on what that play is. Okay. That's one case where he's just in error. The second is the coach calls the play and Ben's like, you know what? Uh, I could get sacked on that play, and that could hurt, so I think I'm going to run my own play. And he gets in there, and uh, he runs the play that he wants to run. Everyone else runs everything else, and it's just a total disaster. And this just goes on the whole game with error and with disobedience to the play. Does Ben have a relationship to the team? Yeah, he's the third-string quarterback, okay? Does he have fellowship with the team? No. <laughs> He does not, he is in disunity with the team. He's not participating with the team. He's doing his own thing. He's got his own truth. He's got his own plays and he's not in fellowship with the team, okay? And so now what this means for us, man, no amount of Christian activity can overcome just active unrepentant sin in your life. And so, so for Ben, he can wear the jersey, he can throw the ball, he can hand it off, he can call the plays. But if he's not running the plays correctly, and if he's not obeying the court coach's orders to run the plays, it's not going to overcome, all his activity is not going to overcome that he's not really running the play. And in the same way for us, man, we could go to Bible study, we could come to church every Sunday, we could go to Regen twice. But if we're not walking in truth, if we're not walking in obedience to God, we're just not in fellowship with him. And so if you're continuing to hold a position that is contrary to God's truth, or you're continuing to be in unrepentant sin, and you're claiming to have fellowship with God, God says in this verse, you're a liar. He says you're lying to God, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody else. 
but God calls you out because he loves you. When we go back to verse four from last week, John says, we write these things so that your joy may be complete. He's not trying to rip you off. He's trying to help you see that the sin in your life is robbing you of the greatest thing you can have, which is fellowship with God. And thankfully, God gives us a better path to walk in. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. So if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, what does this mean? What does it mean that he is in the light? Well, God is in the light because he's always true to himself. He's never dishonest. He's totally consistent. All of his activity and is consistent with his nature. There's no deceit and there's no dishonesty in him. And so for us to walk in the light means to just walk in absolute sincerity. To have nothing to conceal and make no attempt to conceal. Not to lie to ourselves, to God and to others, but just to practice the truth. And the way that we do this is we expose the reality of our lives to others. We, ju- we just expose it to the truth and to the light. Now, uh, I like the outdoors. I like to uh, go places where, um, you know, you kind of got to bring your own water, you know, and you're gone for a while. And uh, the problem with bringing lots of water is it's heavy. And, uh, and carrying water in can be, you know, a tough thing to do. And so uh, someone made up an invention called a Steri pen. And it's this little kind of pen-shaped deal. And what you can do is wherever you go, you can just fill up a cup with like river water that, that would be unhealthy for you. And you put this little steri pen in there and you push it and it saturates the water with UV light. And the light literally kills off the bacteria and the viruses and makes it pure for you to drink. And exposing our lives to the light works the same way. It's a Psalm 139 attitude, which says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. And so how do we do this? How do we actually go about living in the light? Well, uh, if you're in a community group, which I hope you are in a community group and part of this body, uh, when you're together and you're sharing you know, how you fed yourself, how you fed others, how you fed your flesh, that you would just be real. That simple, that you would just be authentic and not make an attempt to conceal. Because when you're concealing, you're not walking in the light, you're hiding in the dark. And so that we would just uh, not make an attempt to conceal because we're also just denying God the glory of working in our lives in taking that darkness and making it light and and growing us in our relationship with him when we're denying it. But you might say, hey, if people really knew me here, they'd reject me. And I want you to know that that is false. Number one, because humility looks good on everybody. It just does. And second, uh, vulnerability, when you're vulnerable with someone and you tell them the truth about how you're struggling, that's not repulsive. It's endearing. uh, uh, Yeah, it's endearing. It it, it just creates a sense of fellowship, of intimacy, of of relationship with one another. And and then third, uh, if your community group just, if you've noticed, just isn't doing well, like you're like, man, our group just, we're just not doing everything we should be doing. I want you to ask yourself, how honest are you guys being with each other? Like, how honest are you really being? And if, and if you think you might not be fully honest with each other, just schedule a meeting and say, hey, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the last 2%. We kind of share 98. Let's cover the last two and live in the light. Live in the light about your own struggles. Live in the light about the things, the resentments that you have that you haven't confessed, the conflict that's in your heart that you're not dealing with, just live in the light, walk in the truth. And if you're not in a community group here or you don't have close, uh, faithful fellowship in your life to walk with, man, I just want to tell you, you're in grave spiritual danger. You just are, it's just the most dangerous path you could be on to walk in your Christian life is to be in the absence 
of doing life with people that no one called Jesus Lord. Uh, and so Proverbs 18.1, whoever isolates himself, seeks his own desire, he quarrels against all sound wisdom. It's just a path of destruction. And I would urge you to help, uh, let us help you connect. Come down afterwards, welcome desk. We'd love to help you connect. And then I know that there are people even in this room that uh, want to be members here that are trying to get in community and you're just having a tough time. Like, and that can be hard to connect. And here's what I want to ask all the groups that exist in our church today is that we want you to continually be asking yourself the question, should we add? Should we add, make room for folks to join our group? If you're in a married, uh, if you're in a men's or women's community group and you've got four or less, then I would definitely be talking about you guys. And if you're in a married group with six or less, I'm talking about you too. And we're going we're gonna to send out an email this week uh, that just helps you as a group process. When is it time to add? And I, and I just encourage you to everyone just go through that because there's folks that want to be authentic, that want to live in the light, that want to walk in community and, and we're having a hard time finding a spot. So would you help us? Uh, and then ver- he moves on to the benefits of walking in the light in verse seven. Verse seven says, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That authenticity of walking in the light, it just breeds fellowship. Authenticity just creates intimacy. And if you think about it, if you're going to walk in the light and you're walking in the truth of God's word, you're walking in obedience to God's word, you're, 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 you're agreed on what's right and what is true. Think about this. What great friends do you have where you disagree on what's true and what's right? Like Probably not any like really good friends, where you totally disagree on what's true and what's right. And when you're in a relationship with someone and you agree on what's true and what's right, you can have fellowship. That's walking together. And, uh, and then what is it, you know, cleansing us from all sin? What does this mean? Does this mean when we walk in the light that we're saved? That's not what that means. Uh, my buddy Graham Robbins uh, talks about the mask, uh, not the COVID mask. Uh, he's talking about the mask that he used to wear uh, in church and everywhere he went uh, with a permagrin that said, I'm good, when he wasn't. When he was uh, just in the depths of sin and despair and adultery and lust and, he, and everyone thought he was good because he put the mask on to act like he was. And, and he did that and he, he just shared this last week uh, at base camp, um, just how he wore that mask for so long and eventually he responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit to walk in the light. And he confessed it to God. He confessed it to his wife. He confessed it to his friends. And what happened? Man, fellowship happened. He was restored in his fellowship with God. He was restored in his relationship with his wife, restored in the relationship with his friends. And then God began the work of using that to grow him, to sanctify him, to making, making him more like Christ, to remove the stain of the sins that had entangled him. And that's what it means when he talks about uh, the blood of Christ cleansing us from all sin, is that when we walk in the light, God's going to start to grow us and sanctify us through that process of letting others in, putting the truth on the darkness, and growing. And then next, John responds, Uh, to the second claim in verse 8, which is, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, you know, how often are you in your community group and you get to like, you know, sharing uh, how you fed your flesh last week and you're like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Like, I, I just did good. You know, I was, I was fine. It was no big deal. Man, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And I just want you to know, like, every morning when the elders get together, uh, we've got sin to confess. We're jacked up, messed up sinners like everybody else. And we're having to confess. And we need confession. We need prayer in our lives. And that's happening every Monday morning when we get together. And, and John's point here is that the Christian's posture is not to deny sin, but to admit sin. Man, I can't tell you how often I hear the story of someone growing up in a church environment where the posture was to act like everything's fine, 
and to deny sin when everyone knows it's not, we're not doing well. Our posture is not to deny it, but to admit it. But what does confession mean? So what, what does it really mean to confess our sin? Do we, what do we have to do when we do that? And so confession, you know, like in a court of law, just means you admit to committing the crime. You know, you admit that you're guilty. Uh, I've got a lot of sin in my right foot. And as a result, I have a history of speeding tickets. And, uh, <laughs> and I also commute to Dallas, and so that's my excuse. But I would rack up speeding tickets, and I'd get the ticket, and it would say, all right, what's your plea? Guilty, not guilty, or no low contendere? And uh, I'd just put guilty and send it back. And I just kept doing that. i just guilty, send it back. Guilty, send it back. And then eventually I got a letter from the state that was like, hey, if you keep this up, we're going to take away your driver's license. <laughs> and I was like, okay, maybe I need to slow my roll. But uh, I was just admitting I was guilty. I was confessing to the crime. I wasn't going to say not guilty. I was guilty. I wasn't going to say no contest. They knew I knew, they knew I was guilty. And it was time to confess. And uh, I love this um, This verse, Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality failed as with the dry heat of summer I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not hide my guilt. I said I will confess my wrongdoings to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And so when we confess our sin, we're just admitting. We violated God's law. There's something that we've said, thought, or done that's in opposition to his will, and we just, we stand guilty and we acknowledge it. And so we we either uh, confess sin, like you'll either go confess sin or you'll cope. And, And you'll just stuff it and try to cope. And you'll have that conviction, I hope if you're a believer, that conviction of the spirit that's like, you got to tell someone and you'll cope. So I want to ask you like, how's coping working? I've just never seen that work well. And so what, what are you hiding in the dark? It's okay to tell. What are you hiding in the dark? What are you not being authentic about? What are you not confessing? What is that thing that you said you would take to your grave that's just eating your lunch? where the spirit of God is heavy on you. And, and our step when we're in that spot is just to confess to God and not just to God, but to others, the people that we've harmed, those in our life. James five sixteen: confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed, so you may be prayed for and God will do a work. And so if, if you're not walking in the light, you're hiding in the dark, but there's forgiveness. Thank God that there is forgiveness for our sin. Verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I love that he is faithful and righteous. Faithful meaning that he promised he would. He's faithful to his promises. He said he'd forgive us and he will. And he's righteous because he's dealt with sin justly on the cross. And so he wants us to possess the assurance that we are forgiven. We are in fact forgiven so that we can continue in fellowship. So we don't just wonder like, does God really forgive me? Is God punishing me for my sin? No, God's not. If you're a believer, that means you've trusted in Christ's provision as the punishment for your sin. And so he took the punishment. Now there still may be natural consequences in your life, But God does not punish you for your sin if you've trusted in Christ. He's took the punishment so that you may know that you've been forgiven. And then the last false claim, verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I don't really know anyone that claims that they have never sinned. Like I I rarely hear that. Sometimes you hear like sin's a construct and there's, you know, relative morality and all that. But I rarely hear someone say I'm perfect, like I've never done anything wrong. Now, I encounter self-righteous people because I encounter myself. And my friends would be like, yeah, you better put your name on the self-righteous list because I have a tendency to just think that the way I do it is the only way to do it. And that's just self-righteous. It's not right. Um, But the way I see this show up most 
uh, is when uh, people say uh, that they uh, make the claim of being a good person. Like, I, I'm just a good person. And all you need to do is be a good person. Um, I shared earlier just about how I've noticed that um, kind of untruth in our culture that what God expects of us is just to be a generally good person. And I've heard that because as I've just shared the gospel with people, just strangers, family, friends, like wherever I have that opportunity and I respond to the Spirit and do it, um, I, I ask a couple questions. I ask, hey, on a scale of 1 to 10, if you're to die today, how certain are you? If you died, you go to heaven. And see how they respond to that. And then I ask them a follow-up question, which is, if you're standing before God and he asks you, why should I let you in? What would you say? And like the vast majority of the time, even when it's people that are Christian, the vast majority of the time the response is, if I'm standing before God and he asks me, why should I let you in? I, I'm going to say, I'm a good person. And there's one thing through reading scripture, I can guarantee you, you will not say when you're standing before the God who is light, and it's that I'm good. Like, there is no way that that's going to happen. I mean, just just look through some of these interactions with men that came in contact with God in the scriptures. Isaiah's vision, Isaiah 6, 5, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, and I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Ezekiel's vision. When I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. Peter's witness. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter, James, and John's encounter at the transfiguration. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. The burning bush, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And in in John's vision in Revelation, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Man, there is no way we're going to stand before God and say I'm good. And so if your plan, when you die, is to stand before God and say I'm good, uh, you have not trusted in Christ. You have trusted in yourself in your own works, and they will not stand, and you are not saved. You need to trust in Christ's provision for your sin. And there's good news, point three, that genuine fellowship is restored in Christ. Here comes the hug. All right, I know it's been tough, but it gets more tender. My little children, my little children, I'm writing these things to you, which was all of verse 5 through 10, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for for those of the whole world. And so, and what this means is that he's not trying uh, to condemn you because he's paid for it. He's trying to point you to walking in faithfulness so that you may not sin. I mean, John was the one who saw the woman that was caught in the act of adultery where the Pharisees and scribes brought the woman before Christ and they were like, hey, law says you got a stoner. And Jesus was like, okay, whoever sinned, whoever has not sinned, go ahead and start throwing. And they just start walking away one by one. And Jesus goes to the woman and says, hey, where'd they go? Did they condemn you? She says, no, Lord. And he says, well, neither do I. Go and sin no more. He didn't say just go back to it. He doesn't condemn her. And neither does, John's not saying this to condemn us. He's saying this so that we would not sin. And then if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And John is invoking this picture of Jesus standing before God, the Father, pleading with the holes in his hands, the hole in his side, and going, I paid for that. I paid for that. I'm their advocate. I'm standing for them. I paid for that sin. They're forgiven. Remember, they're redeemed righteous in me. And some people take this as an opportunity to minimize sin. It's like, ah, we're all going to sin, you know, so just don't worry about it. And, you know, that's not the right response. I mean, God promises the Holy Spirit when we believe we were indwelled by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's ministry is to convict us of sin. And if when we sin, there's no conviction, either two things are going on. One, we're hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
We've, we've just stuffed it so long, rejected the Spirit so long that we're numb to sin. Or the other thing that's going on if when we sin there's no conviction is we were never born again. We, were never, we never believed. And so we need to, in both cases, repent and believe in the gospel. And then uh, when he says, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also of the whole world, um, he uses the word propitiation. Some would think he's going to say expiation, which is that he's paid the debt, but he uses the word propitiation, meaning that he has satisfied the wrath of God. That's what that means, that he's satisfied the wrath of God. Why does God's wrath need to be satisfied? Because he is light, and in him there is no darkness. He's got to remove the dark. He's got to satisfy the wrath of God, and it is entirely outside of ourselves. It's an appeasement of the wrath of God by the love of God through the gift of God. Thank you, Christ, for that. And so in close, in summary, our genuine fellowship starts with God. We've got to know who God is, that he is light, that in him there is no darkness. Our genuine fellowship is destroyed by sin, that we wreck it when we wander from the truth and we wander from obedience, but that genuine fellowship is restored in Christ. Now, I could tell you my conversion story about how I repented and trusted in Christ and came to faith, and I've shared that before, but I want to tell you about my recent sin, the sin in the last few months that has uh, pulled back my fellowship with God. I mentioned Twitter. Uh, It just kind of grew like, I just wanted to be on it. I wanted to catch up with the timeline. I wanted to follow what was happening. And, and I noticed that as I'd still discipline myself to get up in the morning to be in the Word, but when I would, I'd, I'd sit there, I'd open my Bible, and then I'd kind of look at my phone, and I'd just grab that. And I'd hit Twitter, and I'd flip through and watch, you know, see what the conversation was, catch up on it, and then kind of tack on a proverb so that I was in the Word. And uh, I... <laughs> I wish wasn't pursuing God. I, wasn't, I was just pursuing this idol that was comfortable and interesting. And so I don't know what it is for you. I don't know if it's uh, an Instagram addiction, Facebook or whatever, or it's just the sin of, uh, you, you, there's a sin that you've committed and stuffed and buried deep so down that it's disrupting your relationship and it's not gonna go away. It's not gonna get better until you confess it. But the call for us is to walk in the light, to confess our sin, to understand that Christ died and paid for it, and to walk in faithfulness. So let's pray that we would do that. Father, thank you for your word and your instruction that our job isn't to deny sin or to white knuckle it or whatever, but to admit it, to confess it, to forsake it. Uh, God, just to walk in in fellowship with you and to acknowledge that our sin, whether it's our error in just not conforming to your truth or it's our disobedience that those that uh, disrupts our fellowship with you. So I pray that you would help us to walk with you in faithfulness, to confess, admit, and repent. Would you help us for that? It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.